good morning, everyone, I guess, still. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming back. Hopefully, you're feeling good and rehydrated. <clears throat> so, name's Tom Hagel. I'm here to talk to you today about the soft power in China, or soft power from China throughout uh, Africa. So, I think the, uh, the talk last night really started to get into this topic in a, a very exciting way. Um, but, you know, something that really, is really top of mind to me as a researcher is to constantly question our bias in terms of how we perceive the global uh, threat landscape and, you know, what are we seeing and what are we not seeing just based off of the uniqueness of, like, our position in the industry and our location, our telemetry, and, and so forth. And through that thought process, there's a big question that comes to mind is, you know, what, are happening, what is happening in the, the less monitored regions of the world where, you know, we don't see a lot of or know a lot of activity that's happening? There's a bit of a gap in our, our uh, threat intelligence, our telemetry, our perspective of the threat activity in, in these parts of the world. Um, two parts obviously stick out to me is Africa and Latin America. So for this talk, I really wanted to focus on, on Africa, specifically Chinese activity within Africa. <clears throat> now to do that, you kind of have to understand a bit of kind of what's going on, China's methodology throughout uh, Africa as a soft power agenda. Um, and so we're going to kind of talk to that and talk about the cyber arm that supports that effort. So when I say soft power, quick definition for those who aren't familiar, we're talking about the way of uh, pushing for power by attraction and persuasion rather than the traditional force or uh, coercion or things like that. <clears throat> so, you know, a big thing that is well reported, well documented, and has been going on for, for decades at this point has been the soft power push by China into Africa through things like huge investments. Uh, what you're looking at here is a demonstration or a, a chart of infrastructure investments, particularly the transportation sector uh, from China, Chinese banks into Africa. And uh, that's just one demonstration of like a soft power initiative. Uh, there are also heavy, heavy investments into media, and other sectors uh, as well. Pretty much a, a leading investment uh, organization throughout Africa. Um, Boston University has a, a great uh, tool to be able to explore this data. And it's not just uh, high level stuff. You can actually see the individual uh, loans and transactions on a per country basis and what they fund. So it's a great insight into uh, stepping into the technological uh, domain. So, you know, at, at no fault of their own, uh, Nations throughout Africa are in a unique position where they are not getting a lot of investment from anywhere else. And the, it's not always viewed as negative to be getting these investments from China. Um, and this quote here is from a, an African official uh, that, you know, that Twitter link kind of explains it a bit more. But um, this is kind of the perception of Chinese investments is they're getting things done. They are getting them the resources that they need to be able to prosper, grow economically, and give them the resources to uh, achieve what they aim, aim for. And, and that's not always coming from other, other uh, nations as well. So, you know, seeing investments coming from the United States is a, is a bit more rare. So talking a bit about the cyber operations that support this, these initiatives, I really want to kind of bucket this into three categories here of, uh, you know, to kind of focus our talks here. So telecom, finance, and the surveillance sector. So focusing a bit on telecom for a second. <clears throat> As no surprise to many of us in this room, um, Huawei, ZTE, and, and other Chinese uh, firms pretty much dominate telecommunications within Africa. And, you know, on the, on the positive side of this, they are doing fantastic work at closing the digital divide, getting telecommunication, internet access, hardware, and things to countries that are typically not being able to afford them, um, or regions that are geographically distant from each other. So there's a, a huge benefit to the culture, uh, the societies throughout Africa, uh, thanks to these firms. However, the negative side quickly um, can be highlighted in, in many ways that's starting to, to grow. Um, you know, two examples here, Zimbabwe, using them as one example for uh, using telecommunications to start to do a bit of information 
uh, or lock down internet, shut down internet during protests, during elections, things like that. There's countless examples of this type of stuff happening throughout Africa. Uh, the example on the right actually got BBC blocked uh, in Burundi, I believe, for, for quite some time. And because of that, that uh, investigative video slash article that you're seeing there, talking about a uh, Burundi intelligence um, torture house that was reported on by uh, BBC. So there's a, a lot of uh, dominance and capabilities that are normal to China that's kind of being provided through the toolkit that they're uh, pushing throughout to Africa. Now the, the operators we see, the threat actors we see operating in the region, kind of wanted to dive into a couple examples. Uh, so kudos to, to my colleagues Alex and some guy named Jags that we all might know. Um, and earlier this year they reported on Operation Tainted Love. Uh, this is a Chinese attributed threat actor that the guys noticed uh, operating within the Middle East, uh, targeting telecommunication organizations. Um, they're loosely associated with the, or they are associated with the kind of the next step of what was formerly known as Operation Soft Cell. So fascinating research there, definitely check it out. But unreported at the time is, uh, we actually noticed that there was a North African telecommunication organization also compromised by these guys. And looking into the timing of that, that intrusion in particular, we start to see some interesting trends that align very closely with uh, Chinese, um, Chinese uh, I guess, interests at the time throughout North Africa. Uh, particularly that organization that was targeted was going through business negotiations that uh, was an opportunity for a merger slash expansion to uh, more, um, more towers, more telecommunication capabilities throughout North Africa. So it was you know, strategically timed. Um, there's a lot of other, obviously, capabilities that are things that would be beneficial to Chinese intelligence, obviously, through that intrusion, based on uh, other things that they're accessing as well, such as uh, the, the merger with the separate organization that has more of a presence in the Middle East. So, so that one stood out uh, to us quite a lot. Now, focusing a bit on the finance side, <clears throat> Finance, obviously, due to the heavy amount of investments that we can see throughout Africa, finance plays a role into a lot of, a lot of specific intrusions, looking for intelligence on uh, the debts, the, the debt trap diplomacy uh, is, that's come, being come to known. Basically, the, the side of the house that is funding these organizations throughout Africa are looking to gain intelligence on the capabilities to be able to pay the loans and either support it or, or uh, try and disrupt it in many cases, we, we feel. One example of um, financial investments throughout Africa that kind of highlights like the soft power side, not necessarily, necessarily associ associated with a particular intrusion, but I wanted to kind of give you a, uh, some insight into how um, you know, the, the finance sector in, in, in Africa. Um, one example are the dominance of the money, uh, mobile money platforms. Uh, this is M-Pesa, it's just one of many examples, but this was a, a, dom a domestically uh, founded platform that allows uh, mobile transactions of, of finance. It's kind of like the Venmo of the Africa in, in many ways. Um, it's now today massive, relied on by many countries, millions and millions of users, and it's becoming like a key financial uh, platform uh, for, for many countries throughout Africa. Uh, today that's actually supported on, uh, the been transferred to and supported on the Huawei mobile money platform. Um, relying on their staff for expertise as well, I think you know, many of us in this room can understand that the, the reliance of a, of a nation's key uh, financial platform to be managed by a foreign uh, country is, is uh, concerning in its own. Now talking about threat actors that we see having interest in the finance sector, um, not necessarily with that organization in particular, but finance focused threat actors throughout Africa uh, one sticks out to us, which is backdoor diplomacy. <clears throat> Kudos to our friends here from ESET. They did amazing research a while back on backdoor diplomacy, and then uh, others have come through, Unit 42, back, uh, Bitdefender, and, and a few others. But uh, this actor is loosely associated as like a subgroup of APT15 out of China is what, how we look at it. But uh, based on that, uh, the previous uh, reports of the, this group, you can do some infrastructure analysis and kind of identify additional victims based off of uh, clues and targeting and uh, you know, there are typical ways of trying to identify victims through infrastructure. Um, that leads us to a couple that stand out that haven't really been super well reported throughout Africa. Uh, financial organizations in South Africa, Kenya, Senegal, Ethiopia uh, are the ones that kind of stick out to me as more recent. 
um, adding on with open source intelligence and things that aren't, aren't quite public, you get into Nigeria, Libya, and a, a few others. So there's a clear interest on the financial side from this group. <clears throat> However, um, you know, to, to last night's point, a lot of organizations will see that and say, oh, I don't care. I'm, I have no presence or business in these countries. Um, why, why, should I why should that matter? Well, this group does have a presence outside of Africa as well. Uh, kudos to Reuters who did the report on um, them actually targeting Kenyan intelligence. Uh, we have insight into them also having a presence within uh, Europe, Middle East, and US as well. <clears throat> so talking about the surveillance side of the house, um, you know, soft power push throughout Africa on the surveillance domain. Um, this is one example of their safe city project from Huawei. It's basically a prepackaged platform that gives you everything from like you know, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and capabilities to kind of deploy a surveillance package to manage a whole city. Um, that's a big one. Uh, another one that's not super well known is actually CloudWalk technology that was uh, pushed throughout um, Zimbabwe. Uh, safe city in particular is, is quite a few uh, major cities throughout Africa. But CloudWalk technology, <clears throat> uh, you may have heard them, they were actually responsible for a lot of human rights violations uh, targeting Muslim minority groups throughout uh, China. So there's a, a lot of um, you know, negative capabilities being provided in many ways, uh, and having that capability relied on uh, and supported by Chinese uh, Huawei in particular employees. You get examples like this. Um, this is a, a man named Bobby Wine. <clears throat> Political opposition in Uganda uh, a couple years back, basically he went through a few um, cases of having the opposition, the current government in Uganda, tracking him, uh, trying to disrupt, pro or disrupt um, uh, political initiatives internally, trying to arrest him, things like that, lock him in his home. There's a whole story uh, from Wall Street Journal on this, this individual that I recommend checking out. Fascinating from like a, a uh, threat intel perspective or you know, paranoia security side. He actually had a pretty good OPSEC with uh, using uh, burner phones to try and limit the tracking um, and doing misdirection with other phones tied to him, setting him in different directions. So fascinating story to kind of see the, the, the alternate side of these countries deploying um, Chinese surveillance technology. Now, another example that got a lot of, that got a bit more attention in the, in the West is uh, the, the case with the African Union headquarters in, in Ethiopia. Uh, for anyone not familiar, this building, uh, the headquarters for African Union, finished in 2012, construction finished in 2012, um, it was completely funded and, and built by uh, China, apparently, at a cost of roughly 200 uh, million. So, quick timeline of some interesting thing that's kind of, kind of, kind of stemmed from this. Um, which make this particular uh, headquarters of interest to us, I'd say. Uh, January 2012, like I mentioned, construction finished. Finished. 2017, um, employees of the African Union IT staff began noticing servers internal to the network, beaconing outbound. Uh, apparently, or reportedly, the infrastructure was all Huawei, Huawei stuff, um, so they ripped it all out. Uh, during the investigation, they identified that the server began beaconing out when the construction finished. Moving forward, uh, when the story of this came out, African Union and China obviously uh, denied it, on, obviously on the China side. Now more recently, <clears throat> uh, our friends at JP Cert uh, identified uh, Bronze Presidents, another Chinese attributed APT, uh, C2 that was actually receiving data from uh, servers within the AU headquarters as well. And in this case, they're actually uh, exfiltrating surveillance video feeds uh, and videos of that, so a particular interest, same, similar type of data that was uh, being focused on in the earlier case. <clears throat> and then more recently this year, there's been some uh, light talk, not a lot of technical details, or really any technical details kind of released around this, but there's uh, some cases of potentially destructive intrusion within the uh, headquarters as well, taking down the network and uh, disrupting machines. Uh, if anybody has insight on that, I'm all ears. I'm hunting on that uh, and trying to find some more info. So interesting cases for sure. Shows repeated interest from uh, a, a couple sets of actors out of China, in my opinion. Now, you know, why, why would the, uh, the folks at AU, you know, deny this ever happened in many cases or, uh, you know, a repeated trend throughout many African organizations that are confirmed to be compromised by Chinese actors? Uh, 
you know, there's, it's obviously a very bad idea from their perspective to <clears throat> talk negatively or try and have any sort of repercussions on cases like this when you're so reliant on certain, certain organizations for technology, funding nationwide, um, and potentially, you know, stability uh, for your, your society. So uh, this is kind of the general perception of many of these uh, AU officials and, and, and so forth. So taking a step back, <clears throat> you know, African nations at this point, they kind of face this delicate task of leveraging Chinese technology while preserving their own autonomy. Uh, it's, it's a very challenging scenario for them, uh, especially when no alternatives uh, from Western investments are, are readily available. Now, this scenario is not unique to Africa, like I mentioned. Latin America, a uh, very similar scenario kind of going on, um, pushing soft power agendas from, from uh, China and others uh, through very similar approaches. So, you know, what can we do to, to support this and try to identify and help defenders that want or even need it in, in many cases? And we're only looking at the tip of the iceberg here. There's so much, like I mentioned, we are in this blind spot of what is actually happening throughout these regions of the world. Uh, kudos to our friends at, at Mandiant that even two days ago, I'd update these slides, thanks to them, um, released uh, some information at MWISER conference talking about the uh, Chinese Sogu malware spreading throughout Africa over USB, fascinating case. But there's a lot of other stuff going on as well, uh, even internal to internal African uh, attacks as well. One, in one case, Ethiopia getting targeted by claimed uh, Egypt on their, the build of their uh, critical infrastructure like a dam network. So there's a lot of interesting, interesting things going on. So I think at that point, you know, what I'm kicking off here in many cases is a call to action for all, for all of you in this, uh, this room. Established researchers, in my opinion, some of the best in the world. I'm kicking off what we call the Unmonitored Regions Working Group. Uh, my goal here is for us to collaborate voluntarily in many cases to combine capabilities, telemetry, resources, and try and promote a unified approach towards, towards analyzing the operations we see isolated to these regions. Uh, obviously, my main push and uh, motivation here is to help these organi organizations defend themselves, have their own sovereignty and uh, autonomy and how they want to operate and live in the world. Um, but the impact does spread throughout our, our own uh, regions, including the West. So it's critical for us to understand them. We've got a couple interesting things in play. Uh, some of us have already expressed high interest in joining, so thank you for those who have. If you have not yet, let me know. I would love to talk to you about this and see if we can work together and get some stuff rolling. Um, have some non-traditional techniques to try and bridge our visibility gap on getting telemetry out of this, uh, this region and attract interest from the actors that are targeting uh, throughout that region, and more so engaging with local expertise. We don't want to be the folks that are just doing those lecturings, like I mentioned in the, that earlier quote. We want to actually work with uh, the, 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 the boots on the ground to make a positive impact for them. So if you're interested, let me know. Let's chat. Uh, and if you're interested in more of the particular uh, stories like I highlighted here, definitely check out uh, the blog that I just released. It goes into more references on the, the particulars of all these cases uh, and a few more things we just simply didn't have time to, to jump on there. So with that, thank you, everyone. About out of time. <laughs>